Hello and welcome to Macros with Maithili, the ET Now show that takes a hard look at all the major macroeconomic issues and developments in India and overseas. In this edition, we're going to take a hard look at the government's recent decision to privatize Air India. More particularly, is the modus operandi adopted by the government to privatize Air India really the way ahead for PSU divestment and privatization? And joining me in the discussion, we have three experts, Jitendra Bharga, former ED Air India, Kapil Kaul, CEO and Director Kappa, Centre for Aviation South Asia, and Sindhu Kullar, former CEO, Niti Aayog. Welcome to the show, all three of you. Well, government has opted to sell 76% in AI after hiring off a substantial amount of debt, along with 100% stake in Air India Express and 50% stake in Air India Stats Airport Services Private Limited, a joint venture services company managing airport logistics. My first question to you, Mr. Bhargav, is that yes, Air India does have a huge debt on its balance sheet, thanks to successive governments playing havoc with its functioning, and potential buyers would obviously like to get their hands on it minus the debt. But even so, is this the best way of going about it from the macro perspective? That is, with government transferring a significant amount of the debt to the SPV in order to get a better price, quote unquote, or should we sell it on an as is where is basis, Mr. Bhargav? You know, it's unfortunate that the emphasis has been laid on the debt and the mounting losses of Air India rather than on the tangible assets or the potential that it has for a potential acquirer. I would only disagree on one point that yes, the government could have marketed the disinvestment better. What they have been talking about is the losses and on the one side and those opposing disinvestment believe that Air India assets are being sold as peanuts to the potential, like a scam in the making, one member of parliament made a reference to it. Now, my greatest, why am I advocating disinvestment of Air India, and I've been doing so for the last five years, is the fear of extinction of Air India. I wish the government of India had, instead of talking about the losses and the, its inability to pump in more money, should have said that if Air India is to survive in the current of Thar, what is the prospect of it in five years from now? With 900 odd aircraft ordered by the private airlines, they will naturally be adding a lot of capacity. Air India's market share from a mere 12.7% in domestic, 16.9% of the international sector will only go down. So once you become irrelevant, you naturally pass on into oblivion. So government could have done a better job. Now looking at from the perspective of a potential acquirer, I for one as a very firm believer that these airlines will see a lot of value in Air India. Let us not forget, anybody acquiring Air India will get 16.9% of the international traffic on a platter, pilots, engineers. All these things are available, which anybody who wants it, slots, parking spaces, etc., will take a humongous amount of money and time if anybody is to replicate this for their own growth, etc. So, Kapil, Mr. Bhargav is clearly voting for the privatization, but would you agree with him entirely based on your years of study of the airline industry worldwide? And is this the best way to resolve the disconnect that is there very obviously from what is best from the taxpayer's perspective and what is best from the buyer's perspective? Kapil? Well, um, firstly, I agree with Mr. Bhargav that um, Air India would have got further marginalized. So, there's no question they would have lost market share and, and will continue to, would have will continued to become irrelevant. And for the government, which has already put in about $4 billion in the last five, seven years, our estimate is that minimum you need to put about two and a half, three billion over the next five years. So apart from becoming extremely marginalized and become irrelevant, the cost of that margin marginalization would be another two and a half, three billion. And, and after about five years, potentially you would find, find no bias. So uh, in, in terms of his, in terms of his uh, comment on, on, on it could have been marketed better, I don't know what that meant, but I would have thought that uh, the government should have uh, privatized it in the first two years of, of their tenure. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the decision to privatize is the right decision. And it's a national interest decision because we must not uh, ensure that the taxpayer continues to uh, fight with private capital. Sindhushri, both Kapil as well as Mr. Bhargav are very sure that this is the right decision. But clearly not everybody thinks so because if you look at the standing committee, in parliamentary standing committee, they were quite unhappy with the decision saying that this is a strategic industry. Now my question to you is that are there certain sectors which are strategic, inherently strategic and where the government and the public sector needs to have a stake? What is your view and are airlines a strategic industry in that sense? See, strategic sectors typically would be sectors that impinge on national security and I would say barring defence, 
there are very, very few other sectors where you would expect the government to be a sovereign owner or a sovereign player. In most other industries, particularly airlines that you're talking about today, I would say, I would agree that it is not a strategic sector, but it's a strategic sale, which the government says that it will divest not only its equity, but will also give up management control. Now, it can always be argued that it's a national treasure, it has a national brand, and therefore the only way to maintain that is by keeping it in government, under government ownership. We can keep on arguing about the need for doing so, but the very fact that the financial emergency, in a sense, is so dire, the, and that funds are fungible, resources are fungible. There are many other areas where taxpayer money is needed and needed very badly. So I would not uh, defend keeping it in government hands only for the reason that it has to be protected and it's like a na national treasure which needs to be guarded by, uh, by the state. Mr. Bhargav, it's good that all three of you are agreed on the fact that privatization is perhaps the only alternative, except that all over the world there are many countries where the state still has a stake. So clearly the opinions differ. So that is my first question. Why is it that some countries still feel that the state should play a role in airline industry? Secondly, that the government proposes to retain 24% in Air no, India. It is not that is the, no, let me just, I have another question. That is less than the 26% needed to block a special resolution. Presumably, that's a deliberate decision because the government wants to send a very clear signal to the potential investors that it will not interfere subsequent to the sale. But will that reassure the potential investors? And is that why today we see there is a report that government might think of dis disinvesting entirely? What is your view on both the questions? Very briefly on the fact that many governments have a stake in the airlines and two, on the question of 24% stake see, retaining by the government. You see, it's not a question of ownership. It's the question of giving professional freedom and commercial decision making by the management. What we have witnessed is that the government has been meddling in Air India's affairs. Let us not overlook the fact that when Air India was a great airline in the 60s and 70s, it was still a government airline. The only thing was that political climate was such that the politicians used to have a hands-off policy and Air India had at the helm a strong leader like J.R.D. Tata, now which we cannot have today. So disinvestment becomes the only way to go out. There are international examples, but let's not forget, in those countries, the politicians do not meddle the way they do it in our country. So that's the first part of your question. Now, the second is, government has retained 24% equity. They may have seen some merit. The one thing that the Minister of State, Jensena, said on a program was that we would be like, we'd like to monetize it when the airline does well, it gets listed, etc. Nothing. The only thing is, can the government give an assurance to the potential acquirer that we will not be meddling in it? I've been advocating that all these people who bid for it must take a legally binding assurance from the government that there will be a hands off policy, no kind of meddling. Now, unless that is done, Air India will not have a future. Air India is a treasure, is a national brand, a lot of emotional connect with it. The reality is that you certainly do not want, and that's my response to all those people who have been advocating or opposing disinvestment, to say that, look, if it is a national brand, all the more reason that we must ensure that it keeps commanding the glorious hype that it once had. Now, you cannot say that we will allow it to die gradually, as Kapil also endorsed my view, that with 12.7% market share, with private airlines having placed orders for a large number of aircraft, we don't want Air India to become irrelevant. Pass on to, to, into oblivion later and then regret, wish we had disinvested. Like I keep saying, wish Tata Singapore Airlines had been allowed to acquire it in the year 2001 when they had when bids were invited by the previous NDA government. Why you later? The fact is, take action now. To all the politicians, I have been saying it, a political consensus needs to be built. People need to be told what are the merits of disinvestment and what are the adverse consequences if you do not disinvest. Let us not hide in the fact that Air India evacuates people from abroad once in a year kind of a thing from distress. Indians in distress in countries abroad. The fact is, Air India's survival is paramount. And the revival is feasible only under private, professionally managed 
management. Yes, of course, it is a little unfortunate that we all agree Air India is a treasure, but we say this is a treasure that the public sector cannot cash in on, only the private sector. Just shows how far we have progressed. But Kapil, Kapil has also argued, like Mr. Bhargav, for a 100% stake sale. Is it because you also apprehend government interference? Also, one of the features of the EOI is that government will sell the balance 24%. Though it shows in the past, we go by past track record, given what happened in Balco and Hindustan Zinc, there is no holding government to its word. So will international investment is really by government's promise? Well, um, I, before I answer, I must just reiterate the previous question about there, is a, there are airlines which have, which have kept 26% stake. The airlines which have continued government ownership are failed airlines. You look at Alitalia, perhaps closer home Malaysian, uh, except some city-state countries, city-state countries which are like, like Singapore or, or Dubai and, and Middle East countries. Most of the Successful private companies are in private hands, except the city-state countries. Wherever there is government ownership, there are there are uh, there are clear failures. But coming to the question, our first option would have been to do 100% divestment. Uh, we believe that uh, unlike Balco or Maruti or any other company, this is too strategic. I don't know how we call it strategic. I don't know how, in what sense, Air India is strategic. Um, but um, our sense would have been that the first option is, is to just do a divestment, clean slate divestment. Given the track record of interference uh, by the parliament and, and the lawmakers, state and central level, uh, and given the vested interest of, uh, of uh, the entire system in making Air India uh, be in government hands for, for various reasons, one would, have, one would have liked it to be a 100% clean uh, slate divestment. But 76% for us is a second best option. I believe that the government, if it wants to ring fence uh, the employees by giving them some ESOPs, attractive ESOPs to make the, the uh, VRS more attractive, so I think that's good. If there is a positive valuation later, um, I think that there's no harm uh, because one must also keep in mind that structuring the EUI for a government, one has to balance many, many factors. You, one couldn't have expected the government to do exactly what the uh, industry wanted or uh, some of us wanted. So I think the, the balancing is good. I think the, the case that tomorrow, like Maruti, you would, you would significantly value, uh, get valuation is, is, is critical. And I think if the government wants to ensure that this way the political uh, resentment would be less, I think that's good. The only thing that I like to add is that um, as long as there is a, uh, there's no interference, uh, it, it would potentially mean that it's almost like 100%. Uh, but if, if there is an inter, inter, intervention, uh, which not today or tomorrow, I think that that would be terrible and there would be that risk which the investors will factor in. Sindhushri Kapil is entirely right that the government had to balance many interests. But in the specific case of Air India, precisely because of that, should government have retained a golden share, Sindhu? Well, you can always have so many uh, views on the process and the structuring of the process and hi by hindsight, we have, we have seen in the last couple of decades that there has not been a single transaction uh, in this area which has not been called into question. So always with this clear vision of 2020 hindsight, we do have problems with whatever has been put on offer. I would suggest that we take the government on faith. We say that it has been kept, the, the share has been kept with a clear understanding that it is not for the sake of interference or as many of my colleagues on the panel have said, I would not call it interference. I would say safeguarding public interest in its own manner and to make sure that the process goes through seamlessly. So given adequate assurances, with or without the golden share, let me be cynical and say that interference is always a perception. You can always say government is interfering or when the private acquirer is not happy with some part of the process, this issue can keep coming up whether government keeps the share or not. So for the present, I would suggest that we uh, accept on faith that the government does not mean to interfere, that the government means to protect certain interests. And the parliamentarians are actually looking at aspects of public interest which they believe are correct in their perception at this moment. Okay, faith in the government. Well, I'm not sure how many people have faith in the government. That is a big question mark, of course. But for now, let us all assume that the government is doing whatever it believes is the best interest of the taxpayer. But I'm afraid it's time for us to slip into a very short break. Please do stay with us. We'll be back very soon.
Welcome back. You're watching Macros with Maithili and I'm in discussion with three experts on whether the way we're going about Air India's privatization is the road ahead for divestment and privatization. Mr. Bhargav, you are on record that Air India is in the mess that it is because of bureaucratic interference and from political interference as well. And that is the bane really of the public sector. But even within the public sector, we have seen there are some who are able to keep that interference at arm's length and function efficiently. ISRO being a prime, if rare example. So could we not have attempted to do that in the case of Air India, given that its position has improved in recent years and according to the parliamentary panel, it would have taken only another five years to turn it around fully. So are we kind of giving it up, giving up the jo you know challenge before we it's time for us to do so, Mr. Bhargav? No, you know, as I said earlier, it is not the ownership that matters, it's the kind of way you manage an airline. Why is it that some PSUs have been working well and others are not like Air India. There's a simple reason which I've also dealt with in my book. The reason is Air India suffers from two large malaises. Number one, it, is, it, it entered into a competitive era much earlier than the other PSUs and they will also face the consequences as they go along. Second was that Air India did not have this chairman and managing director from within the organization for the last 20 years. So politicians had a license to interfere in the affairs of Air India and the incumbent chairman did not have the kind of commitment needed to protect the company. So this is a very distinct difference between Air India and the other PSUs. But any PSU which gets into a competition will suffer the consequences because the systemic weaknesses where the aptitude, attitude, competence does not matter, only seniority matters for promotions. The, the decision making is slow, the threat of vigilance is there and then you have a plethora of costs which private airlines do not incur. Vigilance department, a Hindi department, a sports department and you name it kind of a thing. Now this is why I have advocated also in my book, book again that there is a need for PSUs to have two balance sheets. One to take care of the social objectives that they fulfill, which the government must compensate, and the other is the commercial. Because what is happening today is that all employees of Air India believe that Air India has been done in, not because they were very unproductive or inefficient or they did not deliver the way they should have, but because of political interference. And politicians believe that the employees have not delivered. So if we had the concept of a double balance sheet with very clearly outlining the social and the commercial performance, employees would have known that look, even after government infusion of funds, there is a problem with Air India, systemic problems. Working practices have to be re-engineered. You can't be working in a competitive era like the way you worked in a monopoly era, etc. Now this kind of confusion will prevail and that is one reason why the first lot of in the unions which met the chairman of Air India have all voiced their concern or oppose the disinvestment move, which will be suicidal from their perspective also. Yes, that's a good idea of a dual balance sheet. But Kapil, there is broad agreement that government should not be in the business of running airlines and there are systemic problems in the public sector. But the fact is, even in cases where privatization has been tried, like in the case of Italy and Japan, very often the governments have had to re-intervene. So is privatization per se an answer, Kapil? You know, uh, Maitri, before I come to that question, I'm very tempted to uh, react to Mr. Bargo's uh, comment on, on, the, uh, on the union part. I think unions have always uh, done strikes once they had a personal interest or uh, protecting the employee's interest. I haven't seen a pressure from the unions to force a change. Um, that's so strange, frankly. I mean, I have seen strikes in peak times where they wanted to uh, get their benefit matrix up or something like that, but there hasn't been, been a, a staff intervention to force a change. And your instance about some of the airlines that have turned around, yes, the airlines in, in Japan, JAL turned around, the government actually forced that change, bought a professional uh, manager, but the competitive environment in that market is very different from the competitive environment in India. Uh, and and, and th that would be an exceptional case, but you would see going forward an airline like Japan Airlines also getting privatized. I haven't seen a successful airline continuing to be in the government hands, except maybe the Middle East states and Singapore Airlines, because these are city-state countries. The rest of them, frankly speaking, are classic example of failures. And I repeat, fighting taxpayers' money with private capital is, is no longer relevant, especially in a country like India. Yes, you're right, Kapil, on that. But the fact is that even in the private sector, there aren't too many successful airlines which have made profit year after year. 
And Sindhu, even though the point is that you should not be throwing good money after bad, should the decision whether to privatize or not really be a function of the stage of development of a country? Many of the advanced countries that now have, you know, I argue of a case for privatization, earlier in their early stages of development, many of these sectors were in public hands. So what is the right time to divest? The only reason, the only reason that the government needs to be in the public arena is the absolutely basic tenet of, tenet of public policy, that is to ensure access to reach the unreached and serve the unserved, people and areas. Now, this is like a textbook, but this is the only reason that the government needs to stay and be an owner of any particular uh, sector or segment. Now, in the case of airlines, it's very dangerously uh, perched on an edge being gained competitively due to standards of services. Standards of service for a government entity is usually extremely difficult to maintain, and particularly where your com competition is always one step ahead of you in giving you consumer satisfaction, consumer perception, and those intangibles which are supposed to be an experience, an airline experience, it would be exceedingly hard to argue for an airline to remain in government hands. And then I would like to actually broaden this discussion and say that, look, why is it that the private capital or the private sector per se is not supposed to be guardians of na the nation or the national interest? Aren't we all participants in the national development agenda? whether we work for the government or we are owned by the government or whether we are in the private sector or not. So let me put the ultimate, uh, what should I say, fundamental question to all of us. Does it matter that whether Air India is run by a private, uh, private sector entity or, a pub or owned by the government? Okay. What really matters is good regulation, good governance, whether it's corporate or public. This entire argument which has surrounded Air India and other public sector entities of bureaucratic mismanagement, political interference. Now, that has been something which has also been thrown at the executive every day, each day. But the structure, the structure of government, structure of governance needs to change, needs to cater to the changes that have occurred in the economy that also have to be one step ahead of what the sector is driving towards. And in particular, the airline sector, if I hear my colleagues on this panel, is an extremely difficult and very risky sector to keep, keep up, keep it in the, uh, keep it competitive, keep it going well. And in, an, in addition to that, maintain uh, a standard of service which meets consumer preferences and consumer interests. Okay, so coming from a fuero, former bureaucrat, that really is a vote in fear of privatization. But we're running out of time, so very quickly, Mr. Bhargav, can I ask you, what are the changes that you would like to see incorporated in the final RFP? Very quickly, just in a half a minute if you can. You know, the fact is, it's a very good document the government has produced, and I'm sure they will do an equally good job as far as the RFP is concerned. But the, all that you need to do is to address the concerns of the employees regarding their employment and continuing benefit because let's not forget that whatever Air India assets have been created they've been created by the employees it's only in the last seven eight years that the government has infused funding so gum employees interest must be supreme when the RFP is made out and a potential acquirer prospective acquirer who acquires the airline or the government must be creating a corpus of funds out of the liquidation of or monetizing of Air India assets so that they can fund it. And once you can allay the apprehensions of the employees, I'm sure they will come along, they will see the writing on the wall that disinvestment is the only way out to ensure Air India's revival, survival. Okay, Kapil, would you like to add to that very quickly? Yes, I, I just want to add to what Sindhu said. Um, uh, Air India is national and other carriers are not international. So they add significant economic value and I think that debate is, is over. I would like to just see in the RFP one thing very critical, labor is a big elephant and we need to make sure that we need to align the interest of the labor and also align with the interest of the investor. We shouldn't have in RFP any deal breakers as for labor and the future issues with respect to labor. I think that would be a key part what I would look forward in the RFP. Sindhushri, you can have the last word. Yes, I would certainly say that the RFP details apart, I would certainly 
expect that the interests of areas which are currently not well served by the private sector and the areas which are also not supposed to be commercially lucrative are looked after in some manner. People who need access, who need connectivity are reached in some manner, either through a direct understanding with the government by the acquiring entity or by the government directly. So this would be my prime concern that we should not neglect aspects just because they are not lucrative and because the airline is now going to be run by a private sector entity. Well, I'm afraid I've run out of time completely, so I'll have to end this discussion now. Clearly, Jayant Sinha is going to be a very happy man if he listens to this discussion because all three experts are agreed that privatization is the only way ahead for Air India. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhargav. Sindushri as well as Kapil for joining me in this discussion. Thank you also for watching. Remember, we'll be back next week with yet another edition of Macros with Maithili. Till then, it's thank you and goodbye from all of us at ET Now.